Welcome to another thing. I'm Larry Menti. Colleges and universities scrambling for money in a tough economy have turned to online courses and programs as a new revenue source. On the other side, potential students of all ages have turned to these courses and programs to advance their education when they can't commit to the schedule of a traditional classroom education. For those and other reasons, online learning is booming. Ellen Kaloje begins our coverage now by taking a look at the advantages and the disadvantages of online learning. Ellen. The overwhelming majority of students in this country go to what's traditionally called a brick and mortar school. But the number of kids taking an online class has grown by leaps and bounds. And it's not just college and high school kids. We found one mom whose middle schooler is passing with flying colors. It works for him. My daughter likes to go to school. My son enjoys being on his own. He enjoys using the computer. Danielle Bacon's son, Nick, hated going to his middle school. Now he absolutely loves his cyber school and all the perks that go with it. Oh my God, two hours a day is so much better than being stuck in a building for seven hours, cramped wall to wall, the kids getting smacked in the face by lockers and books. 12-year-old Nick Bacon gets all his work done on his own time, but still goes to an actual building for a few hours twice a week. I, I get my work done best when I'm alone, so I don't have distractions like kids. And also when I go in the building, it's a cafe and there's a, you know, a convenience store across the street. Right now, estimates put the number of students in kindergarten through 12th grade taking online courses at just over a million. But Harvard professor Clayton Christensen says by 2019, about half of all high school courses will be delivered online. And Danielle Bacon is convinced Nick will be one of those students. This has just been so much easier for Nick. Nick just didn't enjoy the whole middle school environment and he can sit at home, he can go on at his own time, he can use the computer, which he loves. This is the best thing ever, I love it. Critics of online learning say it's tough to monitor cheating, that kids don't get the socialization they need, and that these cyber schools take away valuable money from some regular public schools. But the Bacon family gives online learning an A plus and says all families should have a choice. Reporting for Another Thing, I'm Ellen Kaloje. Thank you, Ellen. Now to talk more about online learning, Professor Joan Fickey, who is a dean at Montclair State University Graduate School, and also Dr. William F. Burns, who is the Dean of Innovation and Learning Resources at Brookdale Community College. Thank you so much for both being Thank here. You. Um, how popular is online learning now? I'll start with you, Joan. It is, it's extraordinarily popular. However, it needs to be specific to the needs of the persons who participate in it. So while we read a great deal about it and we know that it's here to stay, I can speak for Montclair State, we're very careful about where we choose to use that as the modality for instruction. I suspect that my colleague has a similar but slightly different opinion about how popular it is at Brookdale. Yes, it's growing in, in popularity and it grows from year to year in popularity. And it's a similar situation. It's got to fit the student. It's got to be the right student. And it's important that it is growing because when you're looking at an era in the community college sector where you're having declining enrollments due to a number of reasons, primarily demographic changes or fewer and fewer students graduating high school to come into college as a whole and specifically community college it's an area where you can see some growth and, and that's important not just for the institution but it's important for those students that can get on track to completing their degree in time if they need to pick up an extra credit here and there uh, and it gives them opportunity which is really what in the community college area that's what it's about it's providing students opportunities to be successful yeah it's interesting that we have two types of, of, of institutes of higher education to be able to talk about this and 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 doctor let me ask you and I will also ask you the same question because is this a situation where Colleges have to do this yes. because, yes, okay, yes. go ahead. Before yes. I get even to the money, <laughs> yes. you can tell me that. And why do they yes. have to do it? They have to do it in order to provide the excellence that they normally provide to a greater range of students. Okay, we'll stop there. Right. It's more than that, though, right? Isn't this, this is, this is tapping into uh, another economic resource. It You're is. making more money because of this. We could. We at Montclair have been very selective about this. So we have not jumped on the economic bandwagon as has been the case in other institutions. We've been very slow and very careful about the two programs that are now exclusively online at Montclair State. And they reflect an expectation of excellence in these two graduate programs. 
we want to have more, we're not going to have 100. We might have 10. And they will be highly selective and selected in terms of where we put those programs. Yes, we'd like to make some money on them, obviously. But mostly, we want them to be excellent, and we want the students who would not normally be able to participate in graduate education with us at Montclair State to be able to do so in large measure because the program is online. Okay, that might be Montclair, but Bill, for some universities, for some colleges, this is survival. For some, yes it is. And you look at an era where you have colleges like Sweetbriar College closing, where money's drying up. Uh, mounting student debt. These are major issues that are facing not just the educational institutions, but the students as well. I think there's got to be a little bit of a distinction, though, when you look at online learning, when you have a sector, the for-profit sector, uh, University of Phoenix and places like that, where they charge tremendous amount of money for fully online degrees and make promises about jobs and, and opportunities that may not really exist. That's giving a bad name and a bad reputation to what online learning can do and what it is in, an, in, in a, an area with a community college, like I said, it's, it's opportunity and access. So it's a really two different issues uh, when you're looking at money and profit. We're not a for-profit institution. We don't do this to make money. We do this to help our students be successful. And we, but want, the we money want them to finish. Indeed. What happens at some of these large, for, the, for example, the University of Phoenix, and they've run some really fine courses but many, many students never complete their degrees. What we're interested in is making sure that if we bring them in, by and large, they're going to complete and they will have the degree when they leave. There's a certain discipline for the learner that goes along with online education, which is different. And so we have to be very careful about asking someone to come and participate in this and make sure that they have the skill set and the capacities and perhaps the characterological traits that lend themselves to doing online learning. Discipline's the number one thing, right? And, well, discipline, <clears throat> I, I would like to say the characterological predispositions to being able to. <laughs> it's easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say more uh, I think, too, it's important to understand that in, not every student who's taking an online course is on a, in a fully online degree right program. So it is a, a, it's a revenue stream, absolutely, if, it, if you're going that way for fully online. But we have students who are maybe taking nine or 12 credits. This can help them complete their degree faster. If they pick up uh, uh, three credits here or six credits there during the course of a semester, because it's convenient for them, because maybe they have family issues or, or, or life issues, so they can't be a full-time student, which then adds to their time in college, which then adds to their debt. So it's something that can really enhance their, their educational experience and get them a quality education, get them in and out in the, the requisite time and, and move on for transfer or for career. It's a very, very program. important distinction between an online course and an online program. Correct. There's been an explosion in the number of online courses that are offered across the entire academy. So from, let's say, approximately 2008 until now, we can measure how many of our faculty are teaching a course or two online as part of a program. Has That's there been research done? Yes. Uh, has there yes. been research done on the quality of education that you get online versus the classroom? Yes. And, and, and does it measure up? It depends. It depends on the quality of the preparation of the faculty member and the support mechanism for how those courses are, are mounted. Correct. And you have to care a lot about what you're doing in that online course. It's not better or worse, it's different. Right. And That's so the key. pattern has to be thoughtful about how you're presenting that technological experience because it is different than what you had as an individual when you were in a college classroom. And if you're just taking uh, you know, lecture notes and throwing them up on a web page, that's not an online course. Right. That's, that's not what online learning is about. And there are uh, measures and best practices within higher education that uh, give faculty when they're developing a course uh, things to include to make sure that the course meets uh, where quality matters is one rubric there one yes. thing that exists to make sure that the information is clear that the deadlines are clear that the, the there's a uh, uh, different mo modes of presenting information to students it's not just here's a bunch of things go read them it's videos it's it's uh, 
different experiences that students can go out on their own. I mean, we have we have a chemistry class at, at where I am at Brookdale, where it's it's students are doing experiments with things they have in their homes, so they don't have to come to a lab to to mix chemicals. They can do things at home, and it's meeting require. It's it's rigorous. There is a level of rigor to these classes, and that really begins and ends with the faculty. Thank you so much for coming in. It's a pleasure, doctor. Thank you. Doctor, appreciate it. Professor Joan Fickey, who is the Dean at Montclair State University Graduate School, and also Dr. William F. Burns, the Dean of Innovation and Learning Resources at Brookdale Community College, and you want me to point out that you have open enrollment we as do. well. Okay, <laughs> we'll be right back.